Good morning. I'm Dee Arms, Associate Pastor here at Greenview Christian Church, and I'm so glad that you've invited us into your home this morning for our Sunday School Hour as well as uh, the Worship Hour that is to follow. A few years ago, a poll was taken of people in Southern Illinois, and they were asking them about their, their church attendance. And 51% and of people in Southern Illinois said that they attend worship every week. Another 13% said they go almost every week. Now, 92% of those identified themselves as Christian, and it began with Baptists being the highest percentage, followed by Methodists and Lutheran. Next came non-denominational churches, followed by Pentecostal, United Churches of Christ, and Presbyterian. 8% said that they were other or unaffiliated. Now, 54% of the group identified themselves as evangelicals or as morning and Christians, and 46% said that they did not accept any other kind of any other designation. Now, if 50% of the residents in Southern Illinois attend church every Sunday, as they say, you think they would have a greater impact on our community. Uh, you might expect less crime and, and more uh, lawfulness, less anger, more patience, less poverty, more generosity, uh, less violence, more peace. You think that's what would happen. And it's not to say the church is not making a difference. I believe that it is. But if there truly are this many people committed to the Lordship of Jesus in their life, then I wonder why things aren't better. We, you believe that they would, they would be getting that way. Well, this morning, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus announces the purpose of his mission, why he came to seek and to save those who are lost. And in doing so, he connected with all kinds of people. He was very influential in, in, uh, in sharing his message and, and the change that he made in people's lives. Oftentimes, the people that he was speaking to rejected what he had to say, and the same thing happens to us today, that when we proclaim the gospel, oftentimes we are rejected by, by others. Uh, people do listen, sometimes they don't. So this morning we're going to look at Luke chapter 4 and, and review a little bit about this uh, uh, announcement that Jesus makes about the purpose of his mission, his ministry, but also how we are to follow suit in doing so. So let's start with the, the fourth chapter of Luke. We're following in our Gospel Project books. And the first point the author makes in this study is that, or in this lesson, that as Jesus has finished his temptation in the wilderness, he returns to his hometown of Nazareth. Uh, there he, uh, he declares that he is the Messiah, and he does this by, by validating that claim through Old Testament prophecies. So, Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him, marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Now, I remember my, my first year as a student at St. Louis Christian College. And the first weekend that I came back from school, people at the church were saying, Well, you've been in Bible college a week now. You must be a, a Bible scholar, right? Well, the hometown of Jesus, Nazareth, uh, the country where he came from, the land that he came from, when he came back home, they were, they were amazed at his teaching. And, and they said, isn't this Joseph's son? How did he become such a, a, a student of the word, such a student of scripture? But don't miss the point that's being made here. Jesus is claiming to have fulfilled what the Old Testament prophet Isaiah said about the Messiah. And Jesus said, I am he, I am, I, I am the one. You are hearing today the fulfillment of that prophecy. And it's a bold statement for Jesus to make. Now understand, in the Old Testament, there were 330 prophecies regarding who Jesus is, his coming, his, his life, his death. One person said about that, it is statistically preposterous that any or all of the Bible's specific detailed prophecies could have been fulfilled through chance, good guessing, or deliberate deceit. Now, it's a, a numerical possibility, or, or I guess we could ask, what is the numerical possibility of Jesus fulfilling even eight of these prophecies? Well, if we put it to a numerical equation, it would be one in ten 
to the power of 17 or to the 17th power. Now, 10 to the 17th power, how big is that? It's hard to, hard to visualize that. Well, imagine covering the state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars and then going out and picking up one of those silver dollars and putting an X on it, throwing it back out into the pool of silver dollars two feet deep, stirring those all around, taking a person, blindfolding him, sending him out into that mass of silver dollars, and he would choose a place to stop, bend over, and on the very first try, pick up that silver dollar that had the X on the back of it. And he said, this is it. What would the chance be of getting the right one the very first time? It would be the same chance as the Old Testament prophets writing just eight prophecies and all of them being fulfilled by one person. That is the numerical possibility uh, of Jesus doing this. Now imagine being able to fulfill 330, not just eight. Uh, one writer puts it this way, Daniel was written before 530 B.C., and in that, he accurately predicts the progression of kingdoms from Babylon through Medo-Persian to the Greek and Roman empires, culminating in the persecution and the suffering of the Jews under Antiochus Epiphanes, the destruction of the temple, the death of Antiochus, and the freedom of the Jews under Judas Maccabees. Now, those were things that Daniel had prophesied as he writes his book. The prophecies concerning Christ outnumber all of those. There's so much more, and, 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 and he fulfills all of these. Now, in your book, there's a fill-in-the-blank section in this first, this first uh, uh, part of the lesson. And it goes like this. God is omniscient. We know that God is all-knowing. God's knowledge is complete. And as he is outside of time, he has known from all eternity whatever will come to pass. The reason why Jesus can fulfill all these prophecies is because he indeed is all-knowing, knows past, present, and future. And so Jesus is able to fill the, fulfill these uh, prophecies because he knows all about them. Let me ask you, are there any real-life prophecies foretold about Christians, about believers today? Yes, there is. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica and said, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have already died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the ever in the air, and then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Now, the 61st chapter of Isaiah, it tells us of the mission of Jesus, and that was to proclaim the good news. And according to what Paul tells us, that same good news is that when Jesus comes, he's taking us home to be with him if we're still living on this earth. If we have died, then we'll rise to meet him in the air, and those who are still alive will be taken after that. The prophecy that Isaiah talks about in the 61st chapter is a prophecy that gave hope to the Jewish exiles. And today... The, the prophecies about Jesus give hope to all of us as well that Jesus is who he says he is. So Jesus came and he, and he spoke of a prophecy that validated his messiahship, his, his mission. But the second teaching that we find in the lesson is this, that Jesus predicted that he would be rejected just like the prophets of the Old Testament were. So we pick up with Luke 4, beginning with verse 23. And he, meaning Jesus, said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a widow who, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. Now, Jesus 
possesses the ability to be able to know what his audience is thinking even before they say anything. The audience had heard of miracles that Jesus had done in other parts of the land. And so he knows they're going to be asking him to prove your Messiahship by doing a miracle. Well, Jesus speaks first. And he said, I knew, I knew that, that this is what you were going to ask. And he knew that they would reject him as they did the prophets of old. So he uses some well-known examples of Elijah and Elisha. Both of these were prophets that were sent to the northern kingdom. But a lot of times their ministry went beyond the borders of that northern kingdom. Elijah went to the widow in Sidon. Elijah cleansed Naaman who was, who was uh, uh, covered in leprosy. Now, using these examples, Jesus connects himself with these Old Testament prophets while saying that the audience is just like the apostate Israelites who, who destroyed, who rejected Elijah, and who rejected Elisha. So, Jesus is going to leave Nazareth. He's going to leave Nazareth. He's going to leave his, his hometown and carry out his ministry someplace else along with the, the help of his disciples. Now, do you, do you continue to try and share the good news when you're being rejected by your audience? Those that you've been called to, to minister to? That friend, that family member that you're trying to share the gospel with? Do you, do you stop when you've been rejected? I don't think so. We're, we're told that we must try and try again. Two scientists living in Detroit, Michigan, wanted to make a solution that would, that would clean uh, grease and dirt and bacteria from surfaces. So they experimented with one, one formula trying to get this, uh, this ingredient or this, this cleanser to work. Well, they tried one formula after another, one, two, three, four, then 100 and 200 and 300 and 400. And finally, after the 409th try, they finally came upon a formula that really worked. And today, we have Formula 409 cleanser that we use in our homes. Jesus kept going. He kept teaching, even though he's rejected by his own people. And we must push forward, even when people turn a, a deaf ear and a blind eye to us, when they refuse to listen, when, when we're rejected. Who do you know? Who do you know around you that is marginalized, who are outcast of your community, but still need words of life and hope? They might not reject you, so we're told to go to everyone. The next thing that Jesus tells us, or that the author tells us in the study, is that Jesus continued that ministry even though the people rejected him. So we pick up with the fourth chapter of Luke in verse 28. When they heard these things, when they heard what Jesus said, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. Now remember, he had just compared them, his audience, to, uh, to unfaithful Israelites of the past. They rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. He just simply passed on through. Confronting somebody with the gospel of Jesus that, that convicts us and changes lives is not always very easy. Sometimes there's great outcomes and sometimes not so much. The people of Nazareth had heard the warnings of Jesus and yet they rejected it anyway. And not only did they reject it here, but a few years later down the, down the road, we hear, he, we hear that Jesus is being rejected by the words, crucify him, crucify him. Yet even when they tried to throw Jesus off the cliff, there was that supernatural power, the fact that he was the Son of God that allowed him simply to walk through the crowd unharmed. Now, when you feel like you're being rejected, and when people aren't listening to what you have to say and, and, and they're, they're making fun of you or, or degrading you, whatever it is, because of your faith, I want you to remember, uh, I want you to remember three things. And number one is this. First of all, realize God doesn't differentiate in love. In Matthew 5, he says, He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You see, it's God's son. And, and we can't exist in the world without it. I mean, the, the sun provides for us warmth and light to the earth. It causes plants to grow. Uh, if we didn't have it, we would be in perpetual darkness. It's, in totally, it's totally impossible to live without the sun in the sky. Yet God freely shares it, and he gives it to everybody, good and bad alike. The generosity of God is not determined by our faithfulness to him, and I'm glad that's the case. But it's not just sunshine that he sends so unselfishly, but it's also the rain that he sends as an expression of love. Now, wait a minute. What if God said, 
I'll give you some sunshine today if you go to church. Well, attendance might increase. What if you said, I'll send some rain provided that you say prayer five times a week? Well, maybe we would pray more, and then again, maybe we won't. It, it just depends. But see, God showers us all with his blessings. And Jesus said, this is an example of God's love, and I want you to be just like your Father in heaven. How thankful I am that God doesn't, God doesn't give sunshine and rain based on our goodness or withhold it because of the lack of our goodness. We need to remember that, that everyone is entitled to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, no matter who they are, no matter where they're from, no matter what station in life they hold. God does not love differently. He doesn't differentiate, and, and neither should we. Neither should we withhold the gospel of Jesus based on some bias or prejudice that we may have. The second thing is this. Realize that hate fails to show the complete love of God. And we think, well, yeah, that makes perfect sense. But you know what? I think there are times that we tend to separate people into categories. And we do it maybe into three. The first category would be made of people like this. People who look good, they, they share a common interest, they, they fit into our social circles, and, and we put them in that category and we say, I really like you and we're going to have you close by. We, we, we love you. The second category might be made up of people who are casual acquaintances. They're tolerable, but they're not close. And so we'll not put them in a circle, but we'll put them right here. And the third category would be made up of people that we would say, we don't like you at all. So we put you out of that out of that circle altogether. Imagine the mess the world would be in if, if we were in control of the sunshine and the rain. And we would say to the first group, you know what, I really love you. And so we push that button and we give them just the right amount of sunshine and rain. And to the people in that second category we would say, if you behave yourself, if you toe the line, if you do exactly what I want you to do, then maybe I'll give you some sunshine and some rain to meet your needs. And to that third category, we would say, you don't get any. You don't behave the way I want you to. You don't live the way I want you to. I don't like you, and so we're not giving you anything. More often than not, that's exactly how we do behave. We're, we're like children fighting over a toy. And at this point, Jesus knocks the props right out from underneath of us. He says, I want you to love in such a way that if somebody hits you on the right side of your face, you'll turn the left side to them. I want you to love in such a way that if somebody asks you to go a mile, you'll go two. I want you to love in such a way that, that even though you love your friends, I want you to love your enemies as well. That's what he asks us to do. And, and sometimes that's, that's hard to do. It's hard for us to understand. Why? Well, because we have a Charlie Brown complex. Charlie Brown was popular because we feel like him a lot. We feel lonely and, and unwanted and unappreciated and unneeded and unloved. Jesus said, I want you to love those people that are unloved and are unlovable. God shows us that kind of love. We need to show it to somebody else. The third thing is this. Realize that we have a perfect example when it comes to how to love someone else. Now, what is Christian love? And what demands does that kind of love put upon us? In the 10th chapter of the book of Luke, Jesus is having a conversation with, with a man, and the man asks the question, Lord, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus said, well, what does the law say? How do you read it? What's the greatest commandment? And the man says, well, we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And Jesus said, that's right. And, and the man went on to say, what, or Jesus said, well, what else? And, and the man said, and you're to love your neighbors yourself. And Jesus said, that's right, do this and live. You can't love your neighbor well, and listen carefully, until we learn to love ourselves. Now, I'm not talking about a narcissistic kind of love. I'm not talking about self-love, not an arrogant self-appreciation. That's not what I'm talking about. When we love God with every fiber of our being, with every aspect of who we are, then we learn to love what God has created. We are created in the image of God. We're, we're, we're created by Him. And so we learn to accept ourselves for who we are and what we are with all of our limitations and, and, and all of our gifts. So we rejoice that God has made us. And then we begin to love ourselves and, and we love our neighbors, sometimes the ones that we think aren't very desirable, the ones we find hard to love. Love doesn't separate, it doesn't divide people into different categories and, and, and different groups. It doesn't do that. Instead, we love like God does, and we reach out 
to all classes, all races, all kinds of people, regardless of who they are and where they have come from. And when we do that, we find a new dynamic that exists in our Christian love. You know, Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile. Up to that time, nobody had ever done that. It was something undone. People thought it was humanly impossible. But one day, this long, thin, lanky Roger Bannister got up to the starting line, and he took off running, and he ran the mile in less than four minutes. First time that it ever happened. He made headlines. He received trophies, all kinds of accolades. He was acclaimed around the world as the first man to beat the four-minute mile. And then you know what happened? People started doing it a lot after that. I mean, what happened? Roger Bannister showed the world that it could be done. People said, well, if he can do it, maybe I can too. And they did. They ran the mile in less than four minutes because somebody else had set the example. When Jesus said, turn your, turn your other cheek when somebody strikes you. Go the second mile. Love your enemies. When he did that, we sometimes say, oh, I, I can't do that. But Jesus said, yes, you can. I did it, so can you. Jesus said, I am the example, and you can do that too. Following Jesus, doing what he asks us to do, sharing his love with someone else, man, sometimes that's tough. That's, that's not easy. It, it can be hard to do. Sharing the good news can be intimidating. In order to do that well, we need to trust Jesus fully and realize, as the Bible says, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Now, in your study, there's one more fill in, the blank, fill in the blank, and it says, In many instances in Scripture, the term world refers to an active and evil spiritual force that is in direct conflict with God and His kingdom. This evil world force operates under Satan's control, displaying the same self-centeredness and deceit that is found within his character. Christians, however, are called to overcome this world of spiritual evil by faith in the Son of God. Now, the next time you wonder if you can be a person of influence, even in this hostile world, remember this. Years ago, President Woodrow Wilson went to a barber shop, and he writes, I was sitting in the barber chair when I became aware that a powerful personality had entered the room. This man had come quietly in upon the same air, and as myself, to have his hair cut, and he sat in the chair next to me. Every word the man uttered, though it was not the least bit didactic, showed a personal interest in the man who was serving him. And before I got through with what was being done to me, I was aware that I had attended an evangelistic service because Dwight L. Moody was in that chair. I purposely lingered in the room after he had left and noted a singular effect that his visit had brought upon the barber shop. They talked in undertones. They didn't know his name, but they knew that something had elevated their thoughts. And I felt that I had left that place as I should have left a place of worship. When people leave our company, do they feel as though they've been elevated? Do they feel as though they've left a special place because who they are as an individual has been elevated by our conversation, by our comments, our encouragement, our words of life and hope and faith and peace. As you go out this week, understanding that hope changes everything and that you have a mission just like Jesus did, which was to share the good news, I pray that you're encouraged by the fact that even though we're rejected at times, we can still be influential. And sometimes we speak words of hope and we have no idea that after we've left, it's made a world of difference, an eternity of difference in the life of someone else. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for, for allowing us to spend some time in your word this morning. And Father, as you take us to those divine appointments where we will meet with those who need encouragement, who need support, who need strength, who need hope, Father God, give us the words to say, Fill us with the wisdom of your spirit, with the boldness that you have told us that we can have by that spirit. And Father, um, that encourage us to speak words that bring about salvation. I thank you for your love for us, how you set the perfect example of how we can love others. Let us try to do that as, as best as we can and empower us in that effort. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed week.